Well, good morning, good afternoon, good evening to everyone, wherever you may be, somewhere across this lovely world of ours. Thanks for joining us live here today for serverless office hours, streaming on the AWS, AWS Twitch channel, uh, YouTube on serverless land, and also on LinkedIn Live. My name is Julian Wood. I'm a senior developer advocate for serverless at AWS. And today I am super duper happy uh, to have Richard Davison join us, who's a senior partner solutions architect at AWS. Richard, welcome to serverless office hours. Thank you very much, Julian. So I know you, you're also based in Sweden, but yeah, how long have you been at AWS and what brings you to solutions architecture? All right, that's a really good question. Um, I've been to, with AWS during quite recently, so I've only been here for two years. Uh, but what brings me to solutions architecture, I, I love the challenges that it brings on, that I get to work with exciting customers, especially on the scale that, that AWS have. So very interesting customers to work with and very interesting challenges both technically and um, and business related as well. Cool. Well, nice nice to have you along. We're going to be hearing a lot more about Richard uh, Richard uh, shortly. But yeah, Richard's also going to join me. We're going to talk about well, what's new in AWS Serverless. There was this little uh, conference that we had last week at reInvent in Las Vegas. Richard and I, Richard and I were both there with um, what fifty five thousand other people, I think. Um, <clears throat> yeah, it was your first reInvent, Richard. What were your impressions? Impressions was mainly, you know, uh, of course, lots of exciting new news and the scale of it all. Uh, I think we were somewhere somewhere around 50,000 50, plus and a couple of thousand employees on top of that. So uh, it was really exciting to see so many people gathered around cloud and the interest in, in AWS in particular and all the innovation that has happened uh, or is happening during reInvent and especially everything that has been leading up to it, right? We have been working very hard over the last year to bring all these features live. So also super excited about uh, about that, to see them actually come to life and being announced publicly. Yeah, definitely. I mean, the, the funny thing is a lot of uh, customers have come to reInvent and it's the sort of start of the excitement, excitement. but the buildup before it has been going on for months, uh, you know, service teams working you know, literally around the clock to try and get some of their services services out. Some big things are happening. And then us sort of employees, we've got presentations to do and workshops to do and builder sessions and chalk talks and customer meetings and all this kind of thing. So actually getting to reinvent is the sort of, ah, oh, we're here, let's do, all, <clears throat> let's do all, all the cool stuff, which was uh, super good. Also, don't forget we are live on serverless office hours. It is live every day. So please, um, yeah, uh, send us your questions, send us your comments. Hello from Turkey, from Zechariah. Hello from Turkey. Nice. So thanks for joining us via LinkedIn Live. So yeah, let's just quickly uh, uh, have a look at some of the um, announcements that happened over the last week. I'm going to uh, well, pre-invent. I'm going to go from bottom to top. That maybe because that was just in the order of, of some of the stuff that was happening. So yeah, SNS had payload-based uh, message filtering. So yeah, that's super cool. So instead of just being able to use the message envelope with SNS, you can now dive deep into your SS, SNS messages to get uh, uh, for the filtering before you're going to send it on to a further system. Uh, EFS, if you are using EFS, and I mentioned it here because we have a number of customers who are using EFS with Lambda, but there's uh, you know uh, better throughput and lower latency. So that's also going to be cool. Um, Going one up, Lambda announced, uh, well, AWS Inspector support for Lambda. So this is really cool. AWS Inspector is our uh, vulnerability management uh, searching service and now you can point this at your lambda functions and it can do one off or continuous uh, checking and yeah uh, amazon inspector is also used even internally within the lambda service that's how we check that all our managed runtimes uh, are up to date and do our own patching so now you can also use that functionality with your own function code Snap start for Java functions is the whole point of serverless office hours today. Uh, so Rich is going to be talking the, about that a bit, but a little bit later. Uh, but yeah, just things like for a varied uh, pick match, uh, pick a mix of the things. Kinesis, you can stream data delivery to open search serverless directly. So that's a cool kind of thing. And yeah, the, uh, the Amazon S3 data exchange for Amazon S3. And this is quite a cool one. This is about uh, being able to more easily um, connect to S3 uh, objects and buckets in other sort of public uh, accounts, as far as I understand. I haven't delved into this deeply enough, but um, this seems like a cool way that you can access uh, other S3 buckets, which is really good. And then, yeah, two 
and three I've actually seen, I've spotted one missing off the list. But uh, so one of them is event bridge pipes, which is generally available. So this is super useful. We're going to have cover this in serverless office hours next week. And this is a way that you can connect multiple services together with uh, coming from the philosophy of Unix pipes. So one service piped to another service. Well, if you're going to connect something from, say, let's say Kinesis to SNS or SQS to SNS, or all these kind of uh, connectivity between two services, you no longer have to run your own uh, managed uh, Lambda function or something to do that, EventBridge can handle that for you. Uh, it's got uh, an optional enrichment and filtering capabilities all built in, and it's actually using the Lambda event source mapping under the hood to do a lot of the uh, moving data around. So that's something you've probably used already, but now it's all abstracted and a bit easier. Um, step functions, we're also going to have step functions, of course, on serverless office hours sometime as soon as we can. And this is all about uh, using large scale parallel workflows for data processing and serverless apps. So this is sort of a map reduce, but within step functions, and you can use Lambda functions in there, grab something from S3, iterate it over a ridiculous amount of times, and then bring it bring it all back together, which would be cool. The other one, I don't know why this came off my list, but is uh, uh, AWS Application Composer. And this is a visual workflow to be able to build your serverless app. So think of all those uh, SAM templates or CloudFormation templates. Well, now you can drag and, drop the, drag and drop them on a visual canvas, which syncs automatically with your local file system. And so you can do, use it for two things, is to scaffold your apps, and it does all the connectivity between them. Um, and the other way is if you have an existing CloudFormation or an existing SAM template, you can just pull it into Application Composer and it can visualize it for you. So, you know, when you're doing all those docu that documentation, much easier for you now. So that's just what's new. There are a whole bunch of blog posts that have uh, that are backing these up and with some other kind of things from the, uh, the snap start with Java cold times. Um, so, um, so the second one down is from Luca Mezzalira, which is all about the uh, AWS application composer. Third one down is separate from a release, Josh Khan, one of our uh, senior people. There's actually an AWS serverless digital learning badge, which is around announced next week. And this is a whole bunch of things you can go through to sort of prove your knowledge of serverless um, uh, and yeah go through all those and you can pick a number of points and there's some challenges and some cool fun activities to do so yeah that's a, a good way to show your uh, and something a sort of certificate kind of thing a badge you can get from aws and then just uh, very much at the top ben smith uh, serverless espresso is our awesome mobile coffee ordering uh, service that uh, was at reInvent and Ben has created an extensibility platform for that so you can add additional functionality to the core application which you'd be able to register extensions and this is a, just a way to show the importance of event-driven applications and architectures and how applications are, are scalable. If you heard Werner uh, Vogels' keynote I encourage you to watch that all about event-driven architectures and this is a sort of implementation of how to actually do that. So that was the last week of serverless in a very sort of quick, uh, quick go through with all the business and craziness at reInvent. I had a uh, fantastic time. Um, I uh, meeting with a whole lot of people who were there. So if you were there and you're on the stream, uh, thanks so much for coming up and saying hi. It was really good. I did a lot of walking, <laughs> many tens of thousands of steps a day uh, all, all, ac all across Vegas. Uh, but it was certainly worth it to also meet colleagues as well. You know, a number of colleagues we haven't uh, haven't seen. And obviously the most famous colleague of them all is EDJ Ge Geek, none other than Eric Johnson. So yeah, it was fantastic to join Eric and have our whole team there to be able to do the best uh, with serverless. So. Reducing Java cold starts by 10x with AWS Lambda. Yeah, exciting, uh, isn't it? Right? It is very exciting. Richard, uh, mm. tell us all about this. Absolutely. But first, I have a question to you, Julian. Did you went to the so, party to, to replay? Funnily enough, I have to admit, this is the very first time I've been to reInvent when I didn't actually go to the replay party. Um, yeah. No excuses. Uh, <laughs> I hope good. you had a really good reason there, but apparently not. <laughs> it, it was quite a good reason. I gave, uh, uh, gave a talk on, on deeps into the depths of Lambda, and uh, my co-presenter and I met after another dinner, and we were all sort of uh, chatting and, and maybe having a beer or two. So that was my excuse. Um, but yeah, I've I've loved going to the reInvent party, a replay, and done it every kind of year. Um, I did actually injure my jaw this year, so I also wasn't in the in in the huge big um, going mad uh, um, mad part of it. But um, how was replay? It was uh, really cool, actually. I, I oh, was, uh, yeah, I was amazed of, of the scale of it. It was almost like a, actually bigger than than some festivals I've been to. Yeah. So uh, it was really really exciting. So yeah, I could actually, recommend that for people next year and definitely. for you as well, Julian. If you 
Definitely, I'll be back. I'll yeah, be back. I hope so. I know so. there's sort of three massive tents and three, you know, yeah. one uh, dance music area, and I sometimes have another kind of music area and a play area. Exactly. And it's insane that it's just part of reInvent. And yeah, uh, exactly. I was, I was very thing, surprised. Yeah. I really cool to see it in person. Yeah, but on, on the other end of things, uh, Snapstart almost as exciting as partying and listening to Martin Garrix, I guess, uh, if you are <laughs> a Java geek at least. So. Um, yeah, uh, it's a really cool feature. So we can get started with the presentation. Yeah, um, certainly. Let me yeah. put that on. There we go. So uh, Java is an extremely popular programming language, as we all know. Uh, it ha may not have the best reputation when it comes to being fast and performance in, in terms of starting up fast. But on the contrary, it's extremely fast once it's being warmed up and ready to go. And one thing that excites me uh, quite recently um, is the innovation that is happening inside of the Java ecosystem. Uh, it has been around since the mid 90s, basically. And as we can see in this graph is that the release cadence has um, increased very much since uh, about 2017. So we are now expecting almost or around two, two major versions of Java uh, per year. Uh, so I think that this really shows the innovation that is happening in, in, in the ecosystem. And we also have exciting projects such as Project Loom, Project Layden, CRAC or Crack uh, that is that's happening or new proposals that is constantly being added to, to the Java ecosystem and also multiple different Java runtimes or uh, JREs or, or JDKs or Java development kits. So there's a lot of innovation happening. and. Uh, we also have a huge number of customers running Java, especially on Lambda, right? So if you can go to the next slide, um, what we want to showcase here is, is uh, contrary to what you might experience during a development lifecycle, is that most of the invocations of a, uh, of a Lambda function is actually very, very fast. So you can see in this graph on the x-axis, we have latency and on the y-axis, we have frequency. So we can see that most number of, of, of invocations are actually very uh, low in latency. But we have this small bump over here uh, to the right of the graph, right? We see this uh, little hump here. And that is a, a fair amount of invocations that have a substantial latency. And this is really something that we want to avoid. Ideally, we would want to have this slope at the beginning and then kind of gradually fade off into uh, you know, uh, as steep as possible down there because we want to ideally have as, as fast end-to-end uh, -end, uh, duration as possible and, and low latency, of course. So take the next slide, please. So, so to kind of demonstrate the capabilities that we're introducing uh, or that we introduced during reInvent, we have an example Spring Boot application, right? And this application is using an Amazon API gateway to forward API requests into Lambda as, uh, as API gateway event sources. And then we persist some data or fetch some data into DynamoDB. So a fairly simple and straightforward application, but it kind of mimics some of the use cases that we see customers are, are using or building. Uh, so we have what we call a unicorn controller. This is just a name. We call this application like unicorn store. And we have a unicorn service where uh, kind of the business logic resides in. And we have also a DynamoDB uh, unicorn repository following sort of the repository pattern here. Uh, containing a bunch of code that will persist the, the unicorns into DynamoDB. So take the next slide, please. I don't know if it, yeah, there we go. Uh, so in fact, over 99% of all invocations uh, to Lambda are actually um, served by an execution environment. Uh, that is already being warm. So you, you can see that by the graph down here that most of all the invocations actually are being treated by a warm uh, execution environment. And on the contrary, about or 1% or even less than 1% are, um, um, are considered cold starts. So the, these are invocations that happen when we don't have a warm instance ready or when that warm instance is being busy. Uh, so we need to create a new execution environment and that will um, incur a cold start. So for most of the invocations, for this example, we, we can run the 
uh, lambda handler under about, you know, or around 10 milliseconds, right? Uh, so if we take the next slide, please. So in this example, when we don't have any execution environment ready, uh, or when this, uh, your application has been idling for some time, you can see that we have to go through a number of steps in order to invoke your Lambda handle and run the code, right? So the first step is to create an execution environment. We have to download code into that environment. We have to start the virtual machine. That is the Firecracker virtual machine. But we also have to start the runtime, so the Java virtual machine on top of that. After that, we have to initialize the function code. So loading all of your classes, loading all of your dependencies, uh, running your static initializers, etc. And then we have to actually evoke the, the function that you have configured your Lambda function to call. Uh, so we can see that the majority of the work happens in the initialization phase, and only a fraction of that, about 10% in this case, is happening during the invo invocation phase. This is what we refer to as a cold start. You may be familiar with this expression. And again, it's, it's fairly common during the development lifecycle as your application don't have as much load, uh, meaning that not so many um, invocations will run through warm uh, workers of, uh, of Lambda. So we can take the next slide, please. So before we kind of dig further into to how we try to mitigate this or how you should think about this, uh, this set of, uh, this challenge is to look at what, what is actually happening inside of the initialization of the, of the function code. So uh, as opposed to other runtimes such as Python or Node.js, there is a fair amount of job uh, that has to, be, uh, has to be performed when a Java function is being initialized. So we first do class loading. Uh, we do a dependence injection if you use a DI framework. And sometimes this is done during runtime. Uh, others have compile time, which is slightly better. Mm -hmm. But uh, some framework, frameworks, such as uh, Spring Boot, for instance, uses runtime dependency injection. So that has to run in order to figure out the dependency graph and what sort of should be injected where. And we also have uh, just-in-time compilation, or JIT, uh, that is happening to make Java applications run fast uh, rather than run um, in, in what is called an interpreted mode. So every function that is being run, that is every Java function, not Lambda function, but every Java function inside of your Java code uh, runs through what is called this JIT, that is a just-in-time just compiler. And this just-in-time compiler actually translates the bytecode, that is your Java code, um, into native machine code, uh, which makes Java very fast, but it takes some time, right? So you can take the next slide, please. So the current solutions to sort of mitigate these uh, challenges is to uh, think of this uh, in three areas, right? So we can address the class loading by uh, using more lightweight dependencies. Uh, simply put, they don't contain as much classes to be loaded and to be parsed and to be jitted. So for instance, we can use Jackson JR or uh, S uh, LF4J simple, which is a more lightweight API it doesn't maybe have all the same features as a fully fledged logging API, but it contains way less classes, meaning that it's faster on Lambda. Uh, we can also switch uh, from runtime dependence injection into compile time dependence injection. So frameworks like Micronaut, Quarkus, uh, or Dagger, all builds their dependency graph during compilation. Uh, so this also means that we don't have to do this during the initialization, but it's already being generated for us. Or we can simply just avoid doing a dependency action at all, if that's possible, right? Um, we can also tweak the just-in-time compilation. We can add more memory. That is also uh, kind of in relation directly to the, the CPU performance. So in Lambda, the more memory you assign to a Lambda function, the more CPU you get. Uh, you can also tweak uh, the actual JVM flags. You can apply something called tiered compilation, meaning that we will not uh, do as aggressive just-in-time compiling, but more, um, more uh, sort of simpler just-in-time compiling in order to favor the speed up uh, versus the peak performance, right? Uh, and, and also what we can try is, is to do uh, ahead-of-time compilation uh, with technologies such as GraalVM native image, uh, but that requires a bit more effort uh, than what I just mentioned about here. So we can take the next slide, please. So these optimizations all come down to sort of varying uh, amount of effort. So on the x-axis here, we can see kind of the, the effort to modernize. Uh, and on the y-axis, we can see the cold starts uh, and kind of their impact on that. So 
But at the left-hand side, we have pretty simple things that we can apply. Tiered compilation doesn't require any um, code changes. It's just a JVM flag that you can apply using a, a environment variable. Switching to lightweight dependencies might or might not be, be uh, requiring some code changes. Uh, depends on, on how you use uh, APIs. Uh, and we can also try something like provision concurrency. However, that has a, a different pricing mechanism than, than Lambda has by standard. So you have to take that into account. But on the other, other hand here, we have on the right hand, um, right hand side, we have possibility to change your function handler into something like Spring Cloud Functions that might reduce uh, the cold start uh, because it has a different mechanism of, of invocation. We can use newer frameworks such as Micronaut or Quarkus, uh, which then uses compile time dependency injection. Or we can simply try to avoid using a framework whatsoever to keep your Lambda functions uh, as lightweight as possible. And uh, on the furthest right here, we also have GraalVM, which is uh, uh, quite frankly, it, uh, provides extreme uh, uh, amounts of, of performance compared to um, no optimizations at all. I mean, we see an order of magnitude or more um, shorter durations, but it also require uh, a larger effort and, and code changes because you need to make sure that your application uh, works for a ahead of time compiled uh, Java. App. And that, that means some configuration needs to be added. We need to make sure that reflection is handled correctly, et cetera. We have a whole uh, heap of resources uh, and examples to showing you how to do that, but it requires a bit more effort uh, as opposed to the other things on the left-hand side. So uh, what we uh, are, <laughs> are really excited to announce is a feature that we call SnapStart. Uh, and this is aimed to kind of mitigate the problems with uh, Java applications and their slow startup. Uh, again, Java is a very, very fast at peak performance, but a bit slow of getting there because it wasn't intentionally built for being run inside of serverless applications. They were built for running on, on the traditional servers. It doesn't matter if they took one minute to start up or not, but now we are in a completely different paradigm here. So we need that really, really fast startup, uh, but we still want the, all the great things with Java, right? So uh, it offers up to uh, order of magnitude, better performance. And we're going to talk a bit about how it works under the hood here. Um, so how do you use SnapStart? Uh, so it isn't enabled by default. Um, so how you enable it is that you use a versioning inside of Lambda. Uh, so if you haven't used versioning before, it's a feature that we have. We can use it in the CLI, in SAM, in CDK, or uh, whatever means that you want to use. Um, it, it basically allows you to kind of version your Lambda function, quite obvious, hence the name. Uh, so you can configure uh, on a, at a function level that versions should use snap, snap start. And this means that when you publish a new version, we will uh, set the uh, function in a pending state, uh, do the actual in, uh, initialization of the, of the Lambda function, then take a snapshot of that uh, store that snapshot in an encrypted uh, S3 bucket and then offload that into a tiered low latency cache. This means that uh, when we then uh, hit a cold start, you can take the next slide, please, Julia. So when we hit the cold start, uh, we will actually, uh, rather than uh, completely reinitializing the function and downloading all the code, we will just download the snap, uh, snapshot instead and resume from where we le left off. This means that all of your code is already being initialized, all of your dependencies are resolved, and uh, Java has the Java code has been jitted, meaning that it's ready to be uh, sort of uh, really fast. Uh, and this happens again and again um, for all consecutive invokes uh, that are happening after we publish this version. So if you take the next slide, it is kind of demonstrate that uh, for every uh, invoke that is happening afterwards, we will use the same snapshot image and just sort of restore that image and that restore is substantially faster than doing a, a complete reinitialization from from sort of from sort of uh, from zero to, so to speak so richard just to pick up on, on two things the published version is then an asynchronous process that once you've published a version lambda goes and does this 
um, stuff in the background. Exactly. This is before, before, any, before your function has been invoked at all, the published version process then kicks off the snapshot uh, creation. And also know behind the scenes, it may not be one in fact, it isn't one uh, initialization that's done. It can be a number because it's going to um, store different ones across different availability zones and uh, yeah, and different workers and, and yeah. So it's it's kind of a distributed workers, process yeah. and it's asynchronous, just as you say. So there is no way to invoke a, a, a snapshot for a function unless the the, the pub publish um, publish stage has been completed. So when we switch from pending to active, that means that the snap starting process has been completed. And then uh, we can now read from the cache rather than uh, completely reinitializing the code at, at every cold start. Again, yeah, no. uh, the, uh, uh, an important distinction one here is also that this happens only for cold start. So what what uh, we will still uh, have the ex exact same behavior for warm start. So uh, meaning that really, really fast peak performance However, the difference here is that a uh, very, very long cold start that we had in the example that I showed before is now much, much faster. It could be, in fact, it'd be up to 10 times faster because we don't need to do all of the things that I explained before. We don't need to uh, jit all the code. We don't need to uh, initialize all the dependencies. We don't need to run all the st static initializers, et cetera. We can just restore the snapshot, load that into memory, uh, and then resume the uh, virtual machine, which is uh, quite... Uh, quite impressive technology wise of, of how this works oh, definitely and just in terms of this whole actual um the way this is done i'm just putting two links into the the chat which is also coming up on the screen uh, peter DeSantis's keynote on monday night went into detail into how some of this uh, some of this work and then also i actually and i am sort of partly punting my own session but i had a sort of deep dive look with one of our principal engineers chris greenwood a look uh, a closer look at aws lambda <clears throat> And we go into awesome 400, maybe even more detail of exactly how the chunking works, how the how the caching works, and then also how we do this uh, sort of opportunistic loading of the cached bits into Lambda. So if it is a big function, it's not going to be any uh, it's not going to be any slower cold starts. So definitely, I'll oh, stick to clicked on that but yeah definitely have a look at those on on, on youtube uh, the links are in, in the chat as well so literally <laughs> as eric says one billion slides of goodness it's only, 100, <laughs> it's only about 160 eric but uh yeah anyway there were a lot of slides into cool detail and really multi-year journey within the lambda sort of data plane to make this all all happen so that's on that and the second thing i just want to uh, tease out is also this this is a snapshot created once but then when you talk about the resume and invoke it's not just for subsequent invokes of a single execution environment uh, basically as the f function scales are concurrently it's using the same base snapshot and then res resuming completely different functions so yeah. so that's also supporting and i know richard's going to go into that but just looking at this slide over here yeah just to make sure it's not just subsequent invokes this is uh you know create the snapshot once we pull that whole running virtual machine into the lambda execution environment and then can spin up you know tens of thousands of execution environments yeah. all at the same using time. the all using this name snapshot and this is the beauty of it right and all this uh, like you said it's distributed right so it's not just that uh, that for that particular function where you invoke uh, that it's going to learn in, in a cache that is close to whatever that function is being placed right but it's being distributed across all of the workers in and uh, across multiple availability zones in the region right so we have uh it will be very performant, uh, and this is the whole point. So we would reuse the same snapshot across all subsequent invokes uh, for cold starts. And if they're warm, they will still behave the same like warm starts do today. And that's, that's the we kind of we try to mitigate where the performance penalty is uh, with, with uh, Java and Lambda today, right? So we can take the next slide, please. Uh, so what I want to express here is, is that uh, this technology all resides within the Firecracker micro VM. Um, and this is uh, a technology that we have built from scratch uh, at AWS to kind of uh, improve uh, running virtualized machine and doing that very, very quickly. Uh, so both kind of the whole JVM and everything that is running inside of, of Firecracker gets snapshotted. So it's not just the, the JVM itself, it's the entire VM that is running the, the JVM. So it's kind of a virtual machine inside of a virtual machine, right? But the, it's the, the first virtual machine that the firecracker that gets snapshot. Uh, but it's also important for customers to be able to interact with the snapshotting mechanism in order to determine what should be snapshotted and what not should be snapshotted. So uh, we have a, a mechanism for this. Uh, you can take the next slide here. 
so customers can actually add hooks into their Java Lambda function to uh, kind of react to before a snapshot is being taken and after a snapshot is being restored. Uh, so we call those kind of snapshot hooks and they are all using a standardized interface. Um, and more on that later, but the snapshot always occurs at the same time. It always occurred just before your actual um, Lambda function handler. So the handler that you point to in the, in, the, uh, uh, in the function level, just before that method gets invoked, that's when we take the snapshot. So you can kind of take this into consideration when determining what to add in there and, and also use the hooks. And we will see examples of this later in this presentation. So uh, on the next slide, please, we can see what this means. So rather than this kind of seven seconds, as I showcased in, in, uh, in the earlier slide here, we get about 950 milliseconds to first evoke. Right? So from, um, from everything from initializing into uh, when the user gets the result back is a 950 millisecond as opposed to seven seconds as we saw an example. So seven times faster. Uh, great, so how, how do you actually configure it? Um, so it's fairly, it's fairly straightforward. Inside of the console, you have something called snap start, you can see there. Uh, so you, you go in there. If it's not enabled, it says none. Uh, other than that, you go in and, and click on edit and you say snap start published version. There's no other option than none and published version. Uh, or you can configure it through SAM. So SAM has, as you can see here, it's a, uh, in the bottom here of the, of the JAML file, you have snap start and you say that it should apply on published version. Also important is to, if you go back again, Oops, sorry, quick, yeah. quick there, Julian. Also important is to um, uh, this option here that says auto publish alias live. Uh, this is something that we need as well because snap start won't work by default for uh, latest alias. Uh, la dollar latest is, is the default alias. You need to provide a specific alias name and using the auto publish alias will take the latest version, create automatically a new version and, and name it live. Um, so this is something to consider. Yeah, and it's the same for provision concurrency. Also, you need to do that. And the reason for that, and some people are like, oh, why can't you do the live? Because it's actually more deterministic of exactly what's going to happen. Because you, if this is an asynchronous process, you're going to publish a new version. Lambda behind the scenes is going to do all it needs to do, whether that's provision concurrency to scale up or whether it's snap start to create the snapshot. And then when you are ready to point your live or whatever production alias over to that snapshotted function. You have way more control over that rather than at some weird point in time, your Lambda function is just going to go with a new update. So this just makes it way more deterministic. And if you haven't been do using um, aliases and versions before, um, it's actually really simple. Yeah, it's quite straightforward. And, and, and the same thing with the, with the next slide here uh, in CDK, uh, you obviously create your uh, function first and then you create a version uh, and saying what what alias it should have uh, so it, it, it's kind of a two-step uh, process there but uh, about the same uh, the, it's the same output basically so it, it's fairly fairly straightforward so um again uh important to to consider here if you can show the next uh there we go so um when you tie sort of an um, event source to lambda when you have a trigger that is, you have to point to either a version or a specific alias. Uh, so that means that you have to supply the whole ARN. Uh, if you don't use the full ARN with versioning or alias, you're not going to target the this, this snapshotted version, right? Um, use snapshot. So if you uh, omit the last column uh, there, you, you won't trigger your snapshot, uh, snapshot functions. So if you run into errors and see I can't get this working, this is something to check first to make sure that you're uh, targeting the, the right version of your Lambda function. Uh, so a, a bit more into details of the hooks. Uh, these are, of course, optional. You don't need to add them. In fact, uh, there's a high likelihood that you don't have to add them. They really depends on what you're doing inside of your Lambda function. We have a couple of examples when that might be a good thing. Um, so here we have... Uh, how to set up the handle, it's, it's actually quite straightforward. You add, uh, you implement the resource interface here, and then you can see on the top, we import uh, org.crack.core and org.crack.resource. And this stands for uh, CRAC, uh, checkpoint, re um, coordinated uh, sh restore at checkpoint. 
Uh, and that is actually well remembered. I was thinking, correct. I'm not going to remember that. I'm not going to remember that. <laughs> no, exactly. I'm not going to remember. So coordinate the restore at checkpoint is what it's called, and that's an uh, Open JDK initiative. Uh, it's a proposal for Open JDK. So we're using that standard. Uh, it's the same thing that is uh, being applied into Open JDK itself. They're also uh, sort of uh, proposing a snap snapshot mechanism. It's not the same technology that we use. We have a proprietary technology. Um, but it uses the same interface. So you see you do core, uh, get lo global context register, and this is, of course, the resource. And here you have the two methods that to implement before checkpoint and after restore. Quite straightforward. Um, why you want to do this is uh, on the next slide, I will show you why. You might have some considerations. Uh, there's actually three things that we want you to consider. Uh, so the first one is network connections. And yeah, GK, uh, thanks for joining us via YouTube. I know you'd done the question earlier and I could see your question. So we haven't uh, ignored you at all. Richard's about to explain. Yeah, cash connections, what would yeah. we all do? This is all about, this is where we're going to go into this. Exactly. Section. So we're just going to get to that. So the, 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 we have three things that you need to consider. There's network connection. There is um, uh, ephemeral data and there's the u uniqueness, right? Uh, so actually, uh, maybe answering your question here as well. So in, in this case, we have... Uh, a Lambda function that connects to a, a, a relational database service, and it does so eagerly. Um, so it wants to eagerly create, create a connection because that's kind of best practice in Lambda to reuse that connection and not set up a new one on every invoke. Uh, so what 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 can happen here? So Lambda will actually now think that uh, the state of the connection is active because it was so when you did the snapshot. But when you resume at the later stage, and this can be like a week after, right? Uh, this connection will not be alive because the connecting resource uh, might have terminated that collection. So it, it's important to to consider this as as a as a factor and and to kind of uh, work around this issue. In most cases, this won't be a problem at all because uh, libraries such as ORMs or the AWS SDK, we have mechanisms that implements connection retries. Um, so unless you're doing like raw TCP sockets or manually connecting to something, uh, you don't really need to uh, do much of a refactor. refactor. Uh, however, it might be uh, good to know about these things, right? And if you configure like disable connection retries or something that that, that, sh that should be avoided. Uh, connection poles might need, need to um, some, some, some sort of uh, manual configuration, like Hikari connection pool might need to be resetted. Um, and this is things that you can actually do inside of these snapshot hooks, right? The next point here is, is ephemeral data. Um, for this example, we have a secrets manager putting in a secret that we want to load once. And when we resume, we might actually end into a problem where uh, that data is now uh, loaded into memory. It will always be the same because it's part of the snapshot. But look, now our credentials have expired meaning that it's incorrect, right? So in, in a typical scenario like this, you would have a, a after restore hook loading in the secrets again from secrets manager. Um, and finally, the final consideration that, that you should um, uh, think about is uniqueness. Um, we have actually patched uh, Amazon Linux 2, which is the kind of underlying uh, image uh, or underlying OS that, that we run Lambda on. Uh, we have patched uh, that and OpenSSL 1.0.2 to uh, be kind of uh, restore safe. So we have make we have made sure that this uh, supports true randomness. So you can safely use dev random and dev u random, uh, and we can also use mechanisms inside of OpenSSL for uh, uniqueness. Uh, we have also made sure that the Java 11 runtime is validated. So if you use secure random, you should be safe. You should not use you know. Um, uh, other random methods than secure random. And if you use something custom, make sure that you verify uniqueness if, you, if you're using something else, right? So make sure that you're not relying on uh, random values if you're not using the, the mechanisms that we have shown here today. Yeah, so um, I'm just going to jump in because, I mean, this is this is super important in the, from a number of uh, d different areas. One is, obviously, we're going to be cr creating cloned virtual machines, cloned micro VMs from a base snapshot. And the uniqueness is important because if there's a random uh, C generators, as um, uh, Richard is talking over here, that could be used in cryptography. 
So yeah. as Richard said, you know, you don't want uh, 10 virtual, 100, 1,000, 10,000 virtual um, micro VMs all coming up with the same C, uh, random seed uh, generator. You know, that's going to then cause an issue and you can't be 100% sure that your u unique security SSH keys that you're generating when anything is going to be unique. So this solves this. And the cool thing is, is that uh, you know, Amazon Linux and OpenSSL handle this by default. So in a way, this isn't a Lambda specific thing. And I think it's worth calling that out, um, that uh, that this is just something that's done in Java as part of these hooks. And that's also leads on to another uh, 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 comment is that why, why is this only for Java? Well, two reasons. Java's first of all has got, you know, the most painful cold start. So that's why we're doing this for Java as well. And then secondly, Java's got a really robust and feature rich hooks mechanism that we can do this kind of random sorting out. That was a terrible technical term, but a random <laughs> sorting out <laughs> after the fact. So that, that's why we've done it for, for Java. Uh, yeah. The next question everybody did at reInvent as well is, so what about other runtimes? And uh, you know, technically there's nothing stopping this uh, working from other runtimes. That's why specifically I said it's not a, uh, it's not just a Java specific thing, but it's OpenSSL and Linux for these kind of uniqueness kind of things. But yeah. the, the caching and the snapshots and everything is not a Java specific thing that is done outside of that. But we need to be super cautious about all of this snap uh, resilience. And so, you know, we, there's a lot of testing behind the scenes to make sure that things like Node or Python or other managed runtimes or .NET can also handle this uniqueness in the same way. And so hence, you know, we will get there when we're, you know, security being job zero, we're a billion percent sure that um, we can get all this uniqueness and the secure, security done. So yeah. that's the reason coming up with Java first, it's uh, got the, got poor recall, got, longer cold starts and a more robust way to do these hooks and then we'll 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 see what's happening so sorry to d derail slightly but i just i know that's what people are, often ask is um yeah why java and what other languages next so hopefully yeah i mean and there are other languages that that, that or runtimes actually that, that that takes a while to initialize that also uses a, a virtual machine such as c yeah. sharp right and this is a like really cool do. technology and I, I would like to see it in others as well and, we, and we're kind of working on it but like like julian said we need to make sure that everything works uh, from a security span standpoint first. And we are extremely thorough in our testing. That's why we have a, a bit of a, 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 a lag behind when new versions uh, of a specific language comes out and it's available in Lambda. It's because we have to do this very rigorous testing and to make sure that everything behaves according to the best possible security standards, et cetera. So mm -hmm. it's a cool technology. I wouldn't be surprised if we can see something uh, in the future, but right now it's for Java 11 only. And it's for x86 only as well. We are working on supporting ARM as well. And there are a couple of caveats. Um, for instance, we can't support X-ray tracing. We're working on that as well. So um, for now, it's it's for Java 11 only and x86. But more more um, uh, more versions will will eventually uh, come afterwards, right? For for ARM, for instance. Uh, all right. So we have a scanning tool uh, that will help you to identify potential issues or anti-patterns. Uh, so we can use this link, link here. It's on the GitHub. So AWS Lambda Snap Start Java rules. It uses uh, spot bugs to find these issues. For instance, checks for instances of, of Java util random that's unsuitable for cryptographic work, and it will not be snap safe or uh, restore safe in, in this matter. Um, so Next slide, please. Uh, I think we will actually skip down this one and actually see it in uh, in yeah. person uh, so, yeah. because I have a small demo. So uh, we can just say here that when you run the Spring Boot application, it's fairly slow, and when you run it with Snapstart, it's uh, substantially faster. So I will present here. Cool. Yeah. While you're getting your screen up, uh, Dennis. Hey, what's up? Snapstart's up. We're talking Snapstart. Thanks for joining us via YouTube. Uh, yeah, so when, you, when you're ready with uh, sharing your... Uh, yeah, I data. think this should work, right? There we in there. If you can just zoom in a little bit for us. Uh, yeah, for absolutely. The eyes. There you go. Is it good enough for you? Now, now, I just want to caveat this, that, you know, we've we've only got 15 minutes less, and this is a super important, uh, and this is a super important announcement. So I hope the demo is not going to need like an hour to set it all up. <laughs> no, I'm definitely being, I'm, not. <laughs> I'm being a bit facetious because it's actually so simple to turn on. And turn yeah, on. exactly. <laughs> so yeah, what you can see here, this is my base Lambda function, right? It's very, very simple. I'm not going to go into the code changes because they're pretty much trivial, right? 
so what you can see here is that in configuration, I have snap start and I set it to published versions, right? And I, I have a couple of versions here. You can see the latest one is using alias. Uh, and if I go into this one, I can actually see that my API gateway is pointing to this alias version. But if I go back to my uh, non alias or non version function, I can see there's no trigger, meaning that I am uh, have set it up correctly, right? So if you could start with the baseline, I'm just going to do a simple test. This is a, a demo application using Spring Boot. It's loading stuff from DynamoDB. I have an example API gateway request here that will load a unicorn. So I'm going to simply test this one. Now we have to be a bit of patience, right? Because this, this is not using Snapstart. We can see I got a body back here. OK, everything works fine. But what is not so impressive is the uh, initialization duration, right? So the actual latency that I will get here is three point, uh, a little more than 3.7 seconds uh, plus 3.6 seconds here for the duration. So you have to add these two together. That's kind of the intent latency. And then you also have some additional latency of API gateway if you have that as a trigger as well. Uh, so not particularly impressive, uh, but this is kind of the deal. Since we're loading all the, the dependencies, we are building that um, dependency injection graph at runtime, doing a lot of things. So uh, if we then go into our version here, uh, which has snap start that we can see also here, it says uh, if we go into uh, the go, you see my um, my API gateway is connected to this one. I can go into test. It's the same request that goes in here. I'm going to test this one now. And you can see that if you don't notice, it's substantially faster. We can see that we now uh, don't have several seconds here. We don't have 3.7 uh, seconds of restore duration, but we uh, of init duration, but we rather have changed that into something that we call restore duration. And we're now only taking about 250 milliseconds plus an additional of, of 161 uh, milliseconds uh, of duration. So, I mean, about 400 milliseconds here to do the NTN uh, versus uh, uh, almost four seconds, right? So it's more, about 10 times as fast. And as we can see, if we do subsequent tests here, it's just going to be uh, very, very quick, like 11 milliseconds, kind of exactly the same behavior as we have for, for the non snapstart version. Uh, so the only thing I did was basically to add that in. Um, so we can see it's the same behavior for non snapstart version, uh, about the same performance. So if we look into CloudWatch here, we can see for our logs here we, uh, that there is no like Spring logo here anymore because we are not doing the full initialization of Spring, but we're simply just running the handler. Uh, that's that's all we did. We just enabled Snapstart. We didn't do any other changes. If we quickly just go into the code, we can see. Uh, Again, we're using uh, simple. Uh, we're using the, the um, we have a serverless container here to wrap uh, Spring Boot application into make it support Lambda, and we only do handle requests. So, Rich, uh, are you showing the code? Because I maybe you're sharing a, a tab. Ah, uh, okay, you can't see that actually, but it, it's not that uh, we we haven't again we haven't done <clears throat> any code changes. We have simply added a snapshot, a uh, snapstart in here. Uh, and what we did was to do the only code change that we did was actually to add a runtime hook. Let me see if I can switch to this tab. Uh, I can do it like this, maybe. And you see this now. We can go into that one. Yeah, you can see. All right. So what we did here was to this is the only code change we did. We did a added a configuration. We added a before checkpoint hook here to simply run our uh, unicorn controller with a dummy request. And the reason why we did this is to make sure that we kind of uh, exercise that code path. And it's really good to exercise code paths in a snapshot because they will be part of that snapshot, right? So now we can control what's in the snapshot because we run the actual controller with just a fake request here. We don't care if this succeeds or not. And that's why we catch the, uh, the exception in here. But this means that this code will be jitted. So everything that this loads and runs will be part of the, of, uh, the snapshot, meaning that we will benefit from, from the restore. So that, that's, that's actually it. an interesting point, that you don't have to do any code changes to take advantage of this. But there may be some scenarios where you can get even better performance by 
instead of sort of lazy initializing stuff, uh, you know, as you can do with uh, lot, lots of languages, you sort of force the init to do a little bit more than you normally would have to make sure that that is captured within the snapshot. And I know exactly. there's, a, in fact, there's a graph in my Lambda talk where uh, Chris goes through, you know, 90% reduction in the in the snapshot time, and then there was one outlier that was just 10%. And then with a simple code change like this to actually run uh, this, um, this, this, this little bit of code in the initialization phase was then able to then reduce it by another 90%. And that was that actually became then the fastest restore time. So, you know, yep. in general, there's no code, no real code changes you have to do, but you may even get better performance if you do do some sort of your, your own just in time, even though it's not compilation. I don't know a good way to explain it, but a, a good code. Term, but yeah. exercising, we say that we exercise the code, right? Code so exercising, you know, that is good. Yeah, and a, a very good tip while we're on that topic is like, if you create a, a before checkpoint hook like this, if you're using the AWS SDK, do a fake call in here. So imagine you're using DynamoDB or S3, right? So do an S3, uh, you know, uh, get object with a UUID or a random number as, as a, an object key. That means that we will execute uh, or exercise actually all of that code paths and even done uh, do the actual request and the request will fail because there is no no uh, object matching that key but we will have now jitted the code so the jvm will make sure that that code is being jitted that has been compiled by the just-in-time compiler running inside of java and the subsequent real request we do inside of the handler will be, be extremely quick uh, and this is when you see this you know amazing results of, of, of more than 10 10x the performance right but still, again, this is not something they have to do. We just uh, a further optimization. Yeah, and in fact, if you were you, if you are using provision concurrency, same kind of thing. This would be a yeah. good idea to do also in provision concurrency. So yeah, exactly. And even even in Lambda in general, it's a good thing yeah. to do. Eager eager loading, uh, uh, favor that over lazy loading, as if, in contrast to what you're traditionally doing in a, in a server environment. Uh, in a serverless environment, we we favor eager loading. Uh, over lazy loading because that's usually better. It happens once, and then you all will benefit all subsequent requests. Yeah. Richard, how should people think about Snapstart versus or and provision concurrency? That's a very good question. I think that you know this this can be. Um, I would recommend to start with Snapstart uh, and see. You know, am I getting the performance that uh, that I want? Uh, this will still be a, a bit of uh, latency, of course, because we need to restore that that snapshot, uh, but. Uh, it might actually be uh, good enough for you uh, in terms of, of, uh, of performance, right? We are now talking here an order of magnitude for this example for a Spring Boot application, which can be several seconds, right? So start with, I would recommend to start with, with Snapstart. If that isn't sufficient enough, uh, explore the optimizations that we talked about here today. If that still doesn't satisfy your need, or if you have you know, a, a huge spike in loads where even though these 500 milliseconds would, wouldn't suffice, uh, provision concurrency might might be a good alternative as well. Yeah, and then Dennis uh, chimes in with the snapshot and provision concurrency is mutually exclusive, right? You you wouldn't be you wouldn't use both together. No, that's Correct. a good question. Cool. Uh, and then yeah, just one other thing I was thinking of is how does the pricing work for this? Yeah, that's that's very good. It's it's free. Uh, you only charge for for the. Uh, Again, the duration and, and the hooks that are being uh, run as well. So custom hooks, the custom code that you run inside of your hook are, are being charged for. You're also being charged for when the snapshot is being uh, created. Other than that, this comes with no additional cost. So it's the same, it's the same price that it is for, for, for regular Lambda invoke. So you're paid per millisecond per uh, memory configuration. Excellent. Would you mind just switching back to the Lambda console where it ran with snap with um uh, with snap start because yeah. it was actually a good um, a good showing which happened there. <clears throat> so uh, my understanding of the uh, of the the pricing as well as where um, where you ran it with with the snap start and you had that and you there we go we're just going to run it again. There we go. Which is again, going to yeah. be really quick. So if you look over there, uh, without the snap start, you had the uh, you had the init duration and the invoke duration, and the, you, yep. you weren't billed for the init duration, but you were only billed for the invoke duration. Yeah. And so th that's one thing that is slightly different. Here you're now being billed for the restore duration and the actual invoke duration. Yes, uh, but uh, uh, an important distinction here is that you're not built for all of the restore duration, right? Because if you sum up these values, you can see that 158 plus 308 is not 361. 
So this is uh, you know code that is being run inside of your own custom hooks. If you don't have any custom hooks, you're not being built for that time. Yeah. So, that's so the, the, the Lambda portion of the restore to yep. get that micro VM up and running, you don't pay for, yep. but your custom hooks you then are paying for. Which you're exactly, saying, exactly, okay. right. So, and then so also when paying for the initialization time, um, that's not per cold start, that's the one-off process to create that uh, function asynchronously. Yep. So if this Lambda function is going to run a million times, uh, that cold start uh, process is going to run, it's not once because we run it over multiple availability zones and a few different yep. versions of it. Because if you think of this as a, sna a, share, a shared snapshot, if one thing goes wrong with that shared snapshot, you're in trouble. So we do create multiple copies of this just to be safe, to have better resilience, to have better availability. So maybe it's going to be, yeah. be between five and ten. I don't actually know the figure. Yeah. So you're going to see, you're going to pay for five or ten cold starts. That's it. And then yep. when your lambda function runs a million times, you're only going to be paid for that restore duration, plus yep. uh, well, the the hook restore duration and the invoke duration. So yeah, exactly. And and I, again, I mean, this will still be warm. So now when we ran it again, we saw that it was warm. So now it's probably, you know, super fast. So now you're only paying like 30, 34 uh, because it was a warm, right? So it, it's still very beneficial. And a, a benefit cost wise is again, if we add time to uh, exercise our code paths uh, that we can include, like we saw in the code sample, that means our build duration uh, or actually the init duration not the iteration. I mean, the duration of the function will be lower as opposed to you know non non snap start version, as we can see, as we can see here. I, I think it took about six hundred milliseconds, right? Uh, now we hit the cold start. Let's see. Uh, yeah. So you see now it's actually yeah it's about the same, right? It's not or it was actually one hundred fifty milliseconds, right? So we have practically reduced this cost by half and uh, reduce the total duration by 10 times. So again, you, you can use this to, to your advantage by, by putting in, um, uh, eagerly loading in as much as possible inside of the snapshot and benefit from a cost perspective as well. Yeah, excellent. Uh, Dennis has come back with another good question. Uh, so a cache snapshot is being retained for up to 14 days, if not invoked. And the question is, is this a rolling window? So will invocation extend yeah. that window? It's a rolling window, so as soon as you invoke it again, it will be extended. This uh, functions that have been idling and not invoked for 14 days will be evicted from the cache, and then you will hit an error if you try to invoke them after 14 days. Cool. Thank you very much. So yeah, this, so there's not a wait as if after 14 days the next invoke is going to uh, slow down until the whole process uh, until the whole, whole process happens again. And this is just to also to keep it fresh. Again, you're going to see you know between five and ten invokes just on that uh, and. Yeah, it's just a nice way to actually um, uh, also when we update the Java runtime behind the scenes, that's obviously means that this is going to get all the um, is also going to get all the, the operating system updates and Java language runtime updates as well. So you're never sort of really behind. Uh, and yep, uh, Devo joining late. Uh, you can watch a recording afterwards as well. Looks amazing. The roadmap ahead to support other runtimes such as Node Python. Uh, we are looking at that. We discussed that uh, Java was the first one to start, and we will hopefully be looking at other um, other runtimes as well. Well, uh, Richard, thanks so much for joining us. It was awesome to have you talk about Snapsart. Really uh, amazing engineering functionality. It's so cool to see this out, and hopefully, it's going to be um, yeah. Uh, have it a try and let us know. Yeah, uh, definitely. We're looking for feedback. I mean, if, if you run into trouble or anything like that, let us know. Uh, and we will we, you know, raise an issue on our GitHub or just shout out. Uh, we will try to make it as good of an experience for you as possible. And we are really excited to get this out and, and have a super amazing performance for, for our uh, Lambda customers. So yeah, it's, uh, hope to see it in action as well, right? Yeah, and uh, Richard, thanks very much. Um, yeah, thanks for joining us. It's been great to spend time with you. We'll see you in Vegas last week and uh, and uh, spend time this week. Thank you very much. It must my pleasure, Julian. Take care. Richard. And uh, just before we go, next uh, next next week, uh, Dave Boyne is joining us uh, to talk about uh, Amazon EventBridge Pipes. So that was announced at re 